You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. He's a smart one, isn't he? What are you going to name him? They look like just apes to you. He saved our lives. He was, he was remarkable. Apes, apes together! Strong, strong! You're him. You're Caesar. We've been searching for you for so long. I do not start this war. I fight only to protect apes. Get sick, ape get smart. Then human kill ape. But not me. I run. There are times when it is necessary to abandon our humanity to save humanity. Eventually, you'd replace us. That's the law of nature. So, what would you have done? What did the humans promise you? No matter what you do, you'll never be one of them. You are. <laughs> we are the beginning! Apes together! Strong! Have you come to save your apes? I came for you. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to Geek Fest Rant. My name is Carlos Perone, and today we have a couple of movie reviews and collectibles to go over. We are going to start with War for the Planet of the Apes, the latest in the what is now a trilogy of reimagined, remade, rebooted <laughs> uh, Planet of the Ape films. Possibly the best one so far, and a really great, great genre film, which I will be gushing over it as I review it. This particular story brings us even closer to the time where it all started, you know, before we get to that essential, iconic, you know, Charlton Heston Taylor returning to Earth, you know, we are getting closer to that point, but unfortunately not close enough for me, but it is just a fantastic film and we're going to talk all about it. Then we are going to review a film that, as opposed to Planet of the Apes, this particular film is about animals also, but it is a horrible, horrible film that it is so bad that it is practically good. That's how bad this film is. It actually comes to the good side of being so horrendously bad. I'm talking about the Day of the Animals. It is just a cheese fest of what bad filmmaking is all about and... It is, like I said before, it is so bad that it's good. And for collectibles, we are going to go over a line of Ray Harryhausen vinyl figures that came out a number of years ago, all of them depicting some of his most classic stop-motion films. We'll go over the ones I have and give you some hints as to, you know, where to go from here if you're interested in finding these or others in the Ray Harryhausen line. So... Let's begin with War for the Planet of the Apes, and as usual, we're going to have plenty of spoilers here. So, let's get started.
What did I teach you? You are the Duke of New York. You are a number one. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Can you dig it? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That spawn of Satan. <laughs> oh, really? The Force will be with you, always. All right, well, the first movie uh, that I've seen lately is the 3D version of War for the Planet of the Apes. Now, I'm a pretty big fan of this particular franchise and what they've done with it so far. I've followed the previous attempts at, uh, you know, reigniting this classic franchise, you know, from the original films, all the way through the Tim Burton reboot, which was okay, wasn't great. But these latest round of remakes are really, really good. They're really prequels, if you think about it. For this third installment, which could be considered the third of a trilogy, we never know, they might add a few more, depending on how uh, ambitious you know 20th Century Fox wants to be about it. What we have in this situation is that Caesar now has been living off in the woods with his companions, you know, his tribe, but even all the way out in the woods, humans are still sending soldiers to find them, to eradicate them, to kill them, basically. And off the bat, you know, we get a different feel for how things are turning out, how every movie you see how things are deteriorating more and more and more. So now we're down to a basically a military unit that is chasing him around. As a result of an encounter in the woods where some <laughs> apes are killed and a lot of humans are killed too, soldiers, Caesar allows one of the soldiers, he spares their his life, along with a couple of other ones, he tells them to go back, tell their leaders to leave them alone. As a sign of goodwill, he basically does not kill all of them. He lets a few of them live and to go back with the message. But soon after that, as they start to plan out what should they do next one of their scouts including one of his sons returns from kind of like a scouting expedition to let them know that they found another area that might be better for them you know to stay away from the humans it's not a foresty area is more of like a combination i would say desert slash tropical maybe area not so tropical but it's a combination let's just say it's a different kind of an environment a much warmer climate than they have right now so as they're kind of thinking about what they should do that particular night they're attacked once again by the soldiers they come back and this time around by sheer i don't want to call it accident because it's not really an accident but the leader of the humans played by woody harrelson he's known as the colonel he enters like Caesar's bedchamber and kills his wife and his oldest son. Caesar catches him more or less as he's exiting that area and goes after him. And a chase ensues where the colonel gets away and Caesar is completely devastated by what happened. Another one of his children, a younger one named Cornelius, survives the attack. But his wife and son did not. You know, he is devastated, he is vengeful, but he realizes he's got to get everybody out of there. So the plan at the moment is to get everybody out of these forest environments into this new location that they had found. And he is going to go by himself to basically hunt down the colonel. But a couple of other characters decide to go with him, including Maurice, who's the big orangutan. Luca, a very large, large gorilla, and Rocket, which we've seen in previous uh, film, another uh, chimpanzee, you know, they go out to help him. Now, what's interesting is that in this film, you do have, along with the human soldiers, some apes that are helping, primarily gorillas, but there are some chimpanzees too that are helping the humans. They're working with the humans. On their backs, they scribble the word donkey on them, and they kind of treat them like slaves, basically, like, like pack mules for their military equipment. And it is believed that these are kind of like leftover Koba supporters from the previous film, where, you know, Koba was trying to take over, you know, the leadership of the apes from Caesar and did not succeed. However, a lot of his followers then ended up helping the humans to track down the apes. So they're basically traitors to their own kind. 
So on their way out, you know, like I said, the whole group goes one direction, he goes in another direction. The group seems to be going east, because remember, this whole thing started kind of like in San Francisco with the first film, and then they move into the woods of San Francisco, and then they're a little further deeper into the woods, and now the the entire group is moving more, you know, eastwardly, I believe, maybe southeast, something like that. But, you know, Caesar is looking for this colonel. Now, on their way to their destination, they encounter a human that seems to be living by himself. He seems to be a soldier, and as the encounter happens, the guy reaches for his rifle or his gun or whatever, and he gets shot by one of Caesar's companions before, you know, he could squeeze off a couple of shots at them, killing him instantly. As they visit the guy's house, they notice they find a young girl hiding in there, and Maurice is able to kind of bring her out, and she comes with them. Uh, she seems to be unable to speak, and she seems to be very unusual the way she behaves. Like, she's very shy, she's very quiet. Obviously, she's a mute in some bizarre manner. And they continue, you know, on their path to finding the colonel. And once again, along the way, they discover something different. They discovered a couple of soldiers from the colonel's, you know, group that have been shot. But one of them is still alive, and it appears as if the guy cannot speak, even though he doesn't look like he's been shot in the, in the throat or in the mouth or anything. But he has some kind of a speech problem going on that he didn't have before when they first met him. And... Along that location, they run into another ape that is watching them. And that ape goes off on a chase. You know, they're chasing after him to find out who he is, what he's trying to do, because he steals one of their horses. And when they finally arrive at a location inside an, an abandoned building structure type of thing, they do realize and they find out that it's just another ape. It's another chimpanzee. And what's unusual about him is that he is able to talk also. Not as well as Caesar, but a lot. <laughs> and that he apparently belonged to a zoo. And when everything happened where, you know, the infection, the virus started spreading, you know, he got smarter and the humans started hunting down all the apes. And he basically was able to get away and hide all this time. He also tells them that he is aware of a location where, you know, this colonel and this army of humans appear to be fortifying and getting ready for something so he kind of takes them in that direction you know okay this is probably where this colonel of yours is and when they arrive there it's basically uh like a weapons depot it's a place where they you know they have a wall they're building and they have weapons and they have all kinds of storage facilities and a military it's a military base basically that's what it looks like now as they're around there luca is injured and dies as a result of trying to help keep caesar safe Caesar is captured by the soldiers, brought into the compound, where he finds that his entire tribe had been captured before, and they're all there being held captive, you know, in cages, basically. There he once again meets up with the colonel. As we mentioned earlier, the colonel has other apes. I think one of them is called Red, a huge, huge gorilla who's working for the humans. And, you know, he kind of realizes they're forcing the apes to build a wall, a structure in front of their compound. They're trying to wall off the compound from something. The colonel brings Caesar to his quarters, I guess, up, you know, upstairs, and they have, you know, the one-on-one -on -one conversation between the two antagonists of the film, where the colonel reveals to Caesar that not only, you know, did the virus wipe out man, the majority of humans, but now it seems to be having a secondary reaction, and that is it is turning people into mutes and mentally slow. It is having a secondary effect now on them, and that he started noticing that on some of his own troops and made the decision to kill any humans that were now infected by this secondary kind of effect that the virus was having. Therefore, you know, those soldiers that Caesar found along the way, they were killed as a result of the colonel's orders. Uh, the colonel even reveals to Caesar that he had his own son killed, that he killed his own son because of that same problem. And because of that, the reason he's building this wall is because there's another branch of soldiers of whatever 
line of command they used to have that is coming for them because they don't want him <laughs> executing his own troops and they're coming to take over and he's basically being getting ready to fight another set of soldiers that are coming for him so he's forcing these apes to build this wall you know to be able to barricade himself into this location now he doesn't kill caesar because he wants to keep him alive because he kind of realizes he's basically blackmailing him in a way that you know if he doesn't help him build the wall he will be responsible for the other apes being hurt or killed so at first he tries to starve him out and to not give him any water so he's trying to you know debilitate him as much as possible and caesar kind of works out an agreement you know against the wishes of the colonel that if he feeds the you know his apes and gives them water that you know they will work for him so they kind of start working for him a little bit you know building that wall for him but he's getting weaker and weaker they don't know how long he's going to last as this is happening maurice and nova and rocket you know they're trying to figure out a way of rescuing caesar and everybody else you know if possible so nova goes in there and which is the little girl i don't know if i mentioned that her name is nova and i'll explain later how that comes about she sneaks in there and is able to give him some food she's able to grab some food you know the other apes give her like a handful of grain or whatever it is that they're being fed and she's able to bring it to him you know to give him a little more substance to be able to give him some energy to keep fighting you know to keep alive so that you know if he's alive it keeps the other apes alive in a way now they get to a point where she is almost captured and rocket kind of allows himself to be captured to kind of draw attention away from her so she can get away and get back to maurice now the thing is that by rocket now being in the compound as a prisoner he's able to communicate to the rest of the apes what's going on that you know they're outside trying to figure out a way of rescuing everybody and he's also able to communicate with caesar you know through hand gestures and stuff that they have a plan in the works now the plan they kind of figure out is you know between like i said nova maurice and bad ape <laughs> The plan that they kind of figure out is that they're going to go underground through some tunnels and hopefully pop up on both areas where the apes two cages are being kept and the plan is to try to get everybody out through those tunnels you know at night when no one's watching so that night they start it they dig their way through they're able to start getting everybody out but they can't get the kids out through the tunnel uh, because I believe the tunnel starts to flood or something happens, but the adults are able to to be brought out through the tunnel, and the kids are able to climb. The younger apes are able to climb through some wires and stuff from one end to the other end, and it's really it's like a it's almost like a heist, like a like a <laughs> it's like the Great Escape almost. You know all these things that they're they're doing to get from one end to the other, and they get everybody out. So as they're finally all getting out, you know a lot of them get out, but some of them get pinned down because they're they discover that they're trying to get out so the guns start going off the machine guns and some of them are getting killed and some of them are getting away and they're able to kind of get the majority of the apes out of the way but caesar again he's like instead of leaving with them he wants to stay because he wants to go after the colonel he kind of realizes himself that he's becoming so vengeful that he cannot let go of this hatred that he has for this particular human the colonel so he's able to go all the way, you know, to his compound, while at the same time, the other humans are starting to arrive. The other troops are arriving. So they're starting to bomb the compound from the outside, while the soldiers from the inside of the compound are trying to defend themselves. They're no longer worried about the apes anymore. At this point, they're fighting off other humans that are coming after them with helicopters and rockets and all kinds of weapons are being thrown at each, you know, they're being fired at each other. So under the cover of this battle caesar sneaks up into the colonel's sleeping quarters once again and he finds that the colonel is in bed and he cannot speak because it looks as if the virus has now affected him he cannot even form a sentence he cannot talk but caesar picks up the gun off the floor i think or off the side of the bed or something in the holster or something and he kind of aims it at him and the colonel basically wants him to shoot him he wants to die and caesar kind of realizes that you know at that moment he he's done he doesn't want to do this anymore he doesn't want to 
take revenge anymore, so he kind of leaves the gun there for the colonel. And as he walks away, you hear a bullet go off, which is basically the colonel killing himself because he cannot live with this progression of, of this virus that's now afflicted him. As he's getting away and getting away from the compound, Caesar is wounded by the same soldier that he let escape in the beginning of the movie. And he is wounded and it looks like he's not going to be able to make it. And the soldier seems to be getting ready to, you know, hit him once again with like a, I think he had a crossbow or something. And Red, the donkey ape, the traitor ape <laughs> that was his nemesis for most of the movie also, the gorilla, he looks like he had enough of this. So Red kind of sacrifices himself in the process, kills the guy that injures Caesar. And Caesar is able to kind of throw these grenades at a fuel truck causing a, such a large explosion that the wall that they were erecting starts to come down, opening up the way for the rest of those incoming troops, the invading troops to come in and start engaging the colonel's troops, you know, on the spot. They're all in there now in the compound fighting each other. Now, as a result of that explosion of the truck exploding the fuel truck it created such a shockwave around their area and you got to remember also that they are surrounded by snow covered mountains it causes an avalanche and all the apes that are away from that area they start making a run for it and they start climbing all the trees of around that mountain as high as they can go because there's an avalanche coming down and it's about to bury everybody so I would imagine the majority of the apes, all our lead character apes that survived the attack, they all get up on the trees and all the humans are completely, completely buried. And that's the end of the compound and the colonel's troops and the invading troops, all of them. They're all destroyed. And down from the trees come the apes. And now we kind of move on to kind of like a caravan of apes that are moving, traveling, which I guess is the original direction where they were going, and they're finally arriving in an area that seems to be, as we mentioned earlier, there are some deserty areas that they have to cross to get to, and the desert area leads to the beginning of a more fertile grass, trees, uh, you know, not full-blown jungle or foresty area, but, a, but a more of a lush area, which is very reminiscent of what we've seen in the original films of that kind of an environment. You know, you have a, a zone that leads to another zone. And here, Caesar is finally able to relax under a tree with Maurice, and they're talking about how they finally got there. Maurice notices that Caesar does have an injury from before, and it looks like that injury is not getting any better, and he is getting weaker and you know, he's talking slower, and he kind of seems to realize that he's in the process of dying. And as he slowly dies, he can see, and Maurice see, how some of the young apes are playing near the water and down the trees and that sort of thing. And he's kind of happy that they made it and they finally found this home. Again, it's very Moses-like, you know, very Exodus-like what's happening. And Maurice kind of reassures him that, he will let everybody know what happened and how he got everybody there and how he basically saved the entire, you know, tribe, race of apes from the humans. And that's where he passes away. Now, this movie, I think, was absolutely amazing. It's great. As far as genre movies goes... I think it is the best one I've seen this year so far. I know we have more coming. Wonder Woman was a really good one, but this one just completely, completely was a joy to watch. There are so many Easter eggs. There's so many things that are so well made. There are so many funny parts in it. There's so many funny characters. The effects are unbelievable. I've said this since the beginning of these films. They got to give Andy Serkis an Oscar for this. The way that he moves, the way that he talks, the way that he makes it all work, it's fantastic. The technology has moved forward so much since only a couple of years ago when they first started it. The movie is completely full of what I would call, I guess you would call them homages, Easter eggs, if you will. The troops, uh, you know, their designation for their group is the Alpha Omega group, which it's again, it's a callback to the original film of Beneath Planet of the Apes, the city of mutated humans, and they worshiping the Alpha Omega bomb, if you remember. And they all have it, you know, tattooed on the side of their head. 
or on their arms or whatever. Even the gorillas that are working for them, they seem to have been branded with that symbol. There is one character we meet, which we talked about him a little earlier, called Bad Ape. That character almost steals the movie in terms of how funny his character is. Very subtle, very small, but his contribution is so funny. And I can't wait to watch the movie again just to see his scenes because he's so perfect at it. You know, this is a pretty heavy, serious film. And to interject comedy, it's very dangerous, you know, to interject comedy because it might kind of take you out of the moment, but it works so well the way that this is, it's another personality. He's completely different from anybody else. I talked earlier about the, the girl's uh, name is Nova. In the movie, what's very funny is the fact that she takes this thing from the ground to kind of play with it. And Bad Ape says, no, that's mine. And then he kind of gives it to her anyway. And it's the emblem from a car that says Nova. You know, the car is a Nova. So that becomes her name because of the emblem of the car. Uh, so that's kind of cute how they come up with that. She's also carrying a little doll that at some point the colonel finds it near or inside Caesar's cage. And... I never really made the connection because I knew things were happening kind of behind the scenes without us seeing them happen. People were infected, you know, behind the scenes somehow, whether it's through the air or whatever. But I ran across a theory that that is how the colonel gets infected because remember, the girl can't speak, which means she already has that infection of not being able to talk. She's already been afflicted by it. And maybe it's something that it's in her doll because she keeps holding this doll and she forgets the doll behind the colonel picks up the doll with his hands. And now the next time we see him, he's already already, you know, beginning to have, you know, he's having the symptoms of this plague. So it is plausible that, you know, that's how he might have gotten it. There are certain shots in the beginning when they're first traveling with Noba that take place in the beach, at a sunset beach, and it is very reminiscent of the Statue of Liberty shot of them traveling at dusk and the sun is getting ready to go down and they're riding a horse through the beach very reminiscent of that i mentioned earlier there's such an homage to the moses exodus story of of the leader you know taking all the burdens on their you know on top of him and taking his people away to a safety to a to a sort of promised land so that is very heavy heavy on this movie the overall apocalypse now feel to a lot of the things in this movie having to do with the soldiers is there in so many different ways the colonel's character played by woody harrelson you know he shaves his head and he's talking kind of prophetically at times not as wacky you know out there as brando's colonel kurtz but you can kind of tell that there was a bit of an inspiration of the mad colonel you know, leading his troops to hell <laughs> kind of feel to it. And there's a shot in the movie when they're kind of going in the tunnel. I mentioned a little earlier uh, when the apes are trying to, you know, find their way out through the tunnels that somebody had scribbled on the wall, APE Apocalypse Now. That is kind of like, I guess, something that the, some soldier wrote or somebody wrote as a, as a, just to kind of put it there for everybody to see. So like the, the hints are very subtle, but they're there. The soldiers are carrying, you know, their helmets, you know, they personalize their helmets and they write, I think one of them had like monkey killer on it or all kinds of very uh, full metal jacket-ish kind of uh, decorations on their, on their gear. Another uh, thing that I've noticed that kind of reminded me, especially of the first film, is when they're getting close to the colonel's outpost, there are some apes that have been tied up apparently tortured, killed even, uh, and they're strapped, you know, their arms are and legs are strapped to these wooden planks in the form of an X, and they're there to basically to die. And Caesar eventually even gets put up in one of these things. And it is very reminiscent of those um, shots of those uh, fur hides uh, that are supposed to be the border between, I guess, the regular area and the forbidden zone. You know, where it goes from kind of desert, you know, when Charlton Heston first arrives with his astronauts, and then, the, you know, they're walking through, and you see up there on the top of the rocks, these X-shaped fur things covering, kind of like to scare people, like scarecrows almost. And then later, you know, they can find the lush, you know, green areas. So that is also very reminiscent. 
of that. You can kind of tell, you know, Cornelius is the son. Is this going to lead to a Cornelius somewhere in the future? Maurice could be considered at one point, maybe he will become the lawgiver, you know, from the Planet of the Apes films where you have the statue of the lawgiver, the one. Caesar is not the lawgiver. Caesar is the, you know, the guy that freed all, you know, all these apes, but the lawgiver is the one that gives apes their, their laws. So it is possible that he will become that person. One thing that I wish they would have done, and the more I think about it, it does not make sense, is I wish that this film would have ended with the Icarus arriving. However, it could not happen during this time frame because, you know, for it to happen in the way that it did in the original film, a couple of thousand years would have to go by to be able to have the world look so completely different that an astronaut would not be able to recognize it. Ape technology would have to progress so many more generations for them to have their own manufactured goods that no longer resemble human made goods but you know it is now up in the air as to whether they want to continue with this or this is the end i'm not entirely sure the movie seemed to have made a quite a good amount of money so i think it's considered to be a hit for the summer like i said it is a fantastic film it's one of these movies where you sometimes stop you're watching the movie, and you're like, oh my god, this is great, let's keep it going. You know, it's like, wow, I'm actually enjoying, you're not wishing the thing would end soon, or, you know, you're not getting bored, you're not getting too confused or anything like that. It is working, and like I said, there's so many different elements. The humor element is so well done. There are probably more Easter eggs hidden all over the place that I can't think about right now, I can't recall them. But... Once again, this is definitely the time you got to give this man an Oscar because what he, the, the amount of work that he's done in the past is ridiculous. You know, all the way from Lord of the Rings, you know, through King Kong, the first uh, remake of the Apes, the second one, now the third. He's got Star Wars Force Awakens. You know, he's doing mocap work for that too. It's time to give it to him because this is a great, great trilogy if this is a trilogy this is a great one obviously if they continue to go forward with this they can no longer have caesar obviously because now this was the end of caesar's story you do have cornelius his son you do have maurice you do have nova i don't know how they can continue where would you take this story next you know are there any more humans that can threaten them has that been kind of played out already do they move forward now into maybe other uh, tribes of apes uh, maybe battling for control that's a possibility they did that with the original films the original films once they went <laughs> uh, once they did the time travel thing and returned to earth in the past and then they moved forward to the apes being freed which is kind of like what we're dealing with now obviously completely different but that's what kind of what's happening that was followed by the final film which was more about the apes uh, fighting not only a little bit of each other, but also fighting the beginning of these human, these mutated humans, not as crazy mutated as before, but the beginning of that group. So again, I don't know if they want to go in that direction. They're being kind of cagey about it now because they're still trying to figure out, you know, I guess what the studio wants to do. But they've thrown enough hints out there that there is material for more films, at least another film. So we'll see what happens. So this is definitely going to be a purchase when it comes out on 3D Blu-ray. Strongly recommended. All three films strongly recommended. This is probably the best one. And like I said, the between the acting and the the CGI technology for how they do, you know, all the different types of apes, it's amazing. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the past is how difficult it is to do hair. Hair is very difficult to do with CGI because hair moves a certain way, stays a certain way, you know, reacts differently to different environments and that sort of thing. But they nailed it. They, they completely nailed it down. So definitely, definitely recommend this movie. I could not recommend it any stronger. Are you a genre TV, film, sci-fi, horror, fantasy, toy, and convention nerd? Nerd! 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 Do you enjoy listening to podcasts? It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. <laughs> Do you ever wish you could co-host a podcast? Mom! Take it easy. Lower it. I'm, I'm not going to lower it. I have to do this now. I don't mind you playing it, but lower it. This just might be your chance. Somebody help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. 
Shut up! Geekfest Rants is looking for new co-hosts. If you're interested, go to our homepage at geekfestrants.com and click on the hosting icon for more information. Okay, for our second movie segment today, we are going to be doing something that we've only done once before, and that is we used to do movie commentaries, and usually the movie commentaries we would do would be about movies we absolutely love. And only once I remember we did one about a movie we absolutely hated. That was one of the Godzilla remakes from the 90s. Today we're going to review a movie that is so unbelievably bad that it almost crosses into being good. I would actually say it crosses into being entertaining. The name of this movie is called Day of the Animals. And how this movie kind of wound up on my radar is kind of bizarre. I'm pretty sure I have heard of this movie before, but not deep enough to actually want to go look for it. The movie genre itself kind of falls under the horror, nature gone wild, uh, nature gone awry type of theme, you know, um, when animals attack kind of (laughs) theme, if you will. You know, you can kind of lump it into the, you know, on the good side, you have your jaws and, you know, movies like that. And then on the bad side, you have movies like this, you know, you somewhere in the middle, you have, you know, you have your uh, alligator, your orca, you know, all those uh, water attack films. But then you also have lots of animals gone crazy uh, (laughs) movies. And this particular one is from the 70s. It's from 77. And apparently it's from the same group that made Grizzly, another schlocky kind of, you know, animals gone crazy type of movie. But from what I understand, compared to that one, this one, whew, this one is, uh, this one's a rough one. Now, the manner in which I saw this film was I'm just, you know, clicking through the, um, you know, the cable channels the other day. And I do notice that there's a channel that's playing it. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to try it out to see how Bad this could possibly be. And I think it, it might also have to do partly with the manner in which I saw it. And that what I meant by that earlier is I watched it on a channel here that I get through my cable service. I have Xfinity Comcast down here in Florida, a channel called Movies with a little exclamation mark. And it's basically a movie channel. It's a standard tier movie channel. And it seems to play second grade kind of movies, older movies that most channels don't really care about anymore. And what makes the channel worse than just the quality of films that they present is the manner in which they present them. For some reason, anything coming out of that channel resembles like an eighth generation videotape. The quality is so bad. And I can't tell why. Part of me thinks maybe they're using... I'm sure they're not using VHS tapes. I really hope they're not. But it looks like they're using some kind of low-quality video image from some kind of server. It almost looks like they are downloading them straight from YouTube because the quality is just so horrendous. Now, you combine that with the fact that they're using, obviously, a pan and scan version, which, you know, it's still not that unusual for some of these older channels you know, to kind of go in that direction. And a film like this, yes, to see it in better quality helps a little bit. And to see it letterbox eh, kind of help a little bit. But for that initial presentation, and I do use the word initial presentation, it helped to give you this impact of what a piece of schlock that this movie was. But anyway, before I trash the movie too much, let me give you a little bit of the story. And I'll kind of, along the way, I'll, I'll tell you why this <laughs> is such an amazingly bad film. Again, the story is about, uh, you know, right off the bat, you, you're told, you know, in a, in a crawl in the beginning of the movie that, you know, because of the depleting ozone layer, this is an interpretation of what could happen, you know, if we don't you know, resolve uh, the issue of ozone depletion. So what happens here is we meet a the bottom of like a mountain. We have out in the woods a hiking party that is getting ready to go out hiking. And this is a guy that, you know, his job is to um, take all these hikers from different parts of the country, I guess, who come out here to experience the nature and that sort of thing. And they're getting ready to go up and he's having a little chat with like the local sheriff who is a complete, complete stereotypical southern kind of sheriff. 
even though this is kind of taking place in the Midwest, I think kind of like, well, obviously it was shot in California, so these are all California actors, but it, it's typical. And you get to meet all the different characters, um, you know, that are part of this party. And right before that, you know, when we're being, you know, when you see that crawl, you have all these traditional, um, and, and this is something they used to do, they really don't do it anymore, is the showing of the credits of the movie in the beginning, the main credits. Nowadays, it's completely changed. The way that the credits are given, sometimes you don't see credits until the end. You might see just the production company in the beginning, and then you go right into the movie, but back then, they used to give you, for legal reasons, I guess, you know, having to do with unions or just the MPAA or whatever, you had to show Producer, director, written by, you know, screenwriter, based on, music, you know, all that stuff would be at the head of the film. Well, here they do that. And they do this montage of animals, just kind of foresty or deserty kind of animals, you know, just kind of like looking up and staring in one direction, staring in that direction. A bird, like flicking his head back and forth, a, a, a mountain cat, just like growling. And, and it just looks so bad. It was like, some of it looked like it was like typical stock footage that they used. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. But it was just like, when is this movie going to start? And it would just continue and continue. And it's like, all right, well, you know what? That, that's not, let's not be hasty here. You know, this is how films used to start. You used to have a lot of credits in the beginning. The music in the beginning was also kind of weird because it was, to me, it reminded me a little bit of Planet of the Apes. It had this very animalistic uh, sound, you know, very unusual instruments. So it's like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. That's, that's, not, that's nice. You know, I like that. So let's go to the actual members of the hiking party. First off, you have the actor, and I'll give you some of the names. You might recognize them and you might not recognize some, but there's one you'll definitely recognize that makes the entire movie. The leader of the group, the guy who's taking everybody up hiking, is Christopher, actor is Christopher George, who plays Steve Buckner. That's the, is there a name, better name than Steve Buckner? As, you know, he's the leader. Some of the people that are in the in the party itself, you have Leslie Nielsen, you know, famous actor, you know, sci-fi movies, <laughs> yeah. uh, Forbidden Planet, you know, that's a classic. Then you might remember him from Airplane, you know, he kind of started doing comedy and then the Naked Gun movies and so forth and so forth. But here he's playing a completely straight role. He is a serious character, a serious actor playing a serious character. He plays Paul Jensen. He's an advertising man, ex ad executive who's out here in the woods to kind of rough it. And, blah, blah. <laughs> and right off the bat, you can kind of tell something's not right with this character, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Linda Day George, the wife of the leading star, plays Terry Marsh. She is a television anchor who's, again, coming out to the woods to see what things are like, you know, that sort of thing. Richard Jackal, he plays Professor Taylor McGregor. He's kind of like the the nerdy professor who's there to take pictures because he likes to take pictures of animals and that sort of thing. And, you know, kind of like a slightly bumbling, uh, you know, nerdy kind of guy. Then you have Michael and Sarah. He plays kind of like a secondary guide. He's like a local uh, and he's like an, a Native American. That particular actor, you might recognize him, at least I did immediately, from Buck Rogers. He used to be in Buck Rogers. I remember he was one of the princess's uh, henchmen, if you will. But this man has done a million, a million things on television, most of them. Uh, and he's playing a, a Native American in this particular film. Then you have, let's say, a couple that are there, you know, to experience the woods and that sort of thing. And they're kind of, there's a little friction between them. There's a little kind of fighting in between these two, a little bit. And then you have a mother and son team. The mother is this nagging, stereotypical, uh, you know, mom that's uh, overprotective of her son. And the son is somebody who just wants to run around and do all that stuff. And then you have another couple, a younger couple, that what stands out about the couple is that the guy is played by... Andrew Stevens, uh, uh, an icon of a uh, bad cable move, made for TV movie. <laughs> I know he had a huge run on uh, many television shows uh, in the 70s. This is kind of like a uh, somewhat of a younger role for him. He's a little younger than I was used to seeing him back in the 80s, at least, when he was doing a lot of work there, too. And you also have a football player that he's kind of kind of keeping it on the down low that he's a football player. And the word around the group is that, oh, yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's injured. He's, he's suffering from some illness and, you know, just kind of like leave him alone, you know, let him do his thing type of stuff. So they're getting ready to go. And off the bat, you kind of already start to see that they're, 
certain birds hovering around them, even at the low level that they're at, you know, they're going to a higher level of, you know, as they climb up this mountain area, they get up on two different helicopters and they kind of split up. And right there, you can already from the little chit chats between people, you can kind of tell that Leslie Nielsen's character is a little strange. He's kind of making these Native American wisecracks at the Native American character. You know, he's saying stuff like Kimo Sabe to him and this and that. And and what's weird is that because we're so used to seeing him, let's say, from Naked Gun and from Airplane, where he acts a certain way where he's completely serious, he's completely straight delivering funny lines, here, it's so odd watching him delivering straight lines that are ridiculous uh, in terms of embarrassing. And... It almost looks like you're watching a comedy, but it's not because he's doing them straight. And it's I, 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 I'm wondering if this is the, the inspiration that the people that made Airplane got in terms of, you know, we need a serious sounding actor to deliver funny lines in a serious manner. But this is what starts right off the bat, starts happening with his character. So as they continue, you know, moving along, you know, we do get the typical montage of them walking and walking and chatting and chatting and this and that. And Leslie Nielsen's character is becoming more and more of a jerk as he moves along. We have a first attack that takes place, I believe, during their first night. A couple of wolves uh, attack them. And the older couple, girl in the old, from the older couple, she gets, uh, you know, scratched up a little bit. And they kind of decide in the morning, you know, all right, they're going to head back because she's a little freaked out. And uh, so they said, all right, well, you guys go that way <laughs> and we'll continue with our hike. And, you know, you can kind of make your way to it. There's a cabin down there and you can kind of find your way and blah, blah, blah. So those two kind of get separated. And... As they walk away and they start going in their own direction, they kind of come by a stream and a bit of it of a cliff and they're bickering and slightly bickering this and that, you know, because that was kind of like their character, the, the bickering couple. They get to a point where they're kind of close to this cliff and these birds start coming and they're kind of away from each other at that moment and the birds come after her and she's trying to swat the birds away and she kind of loses balance and falls down the cliff and it is the worst blue screen I've probably have ever seen of a person falling but it's perfect for this movie and boom she's dead and he's all freaked out the guy is completely freaked out he's in shock so now he's by himself you know kind of fighting trying to find his way back and you know he's tired he's exhausted from walking so much and he, he keeps going up this stream you know trying to find his way up and he finds a little girl by herself now when you first see this little girl you're like this is going to turn into another kind of weird movie because she's kind of like a scary scary looking little girl it looks like something out of a japanese horror movie uh, but then he kind of gets close and kind of makes contact with her and she doesn't seem to be speaking too much because she looks like she's in some kind of shock or something herself uh so he's kind of like oh okay well you know, we'll go together and he gives her a hug or whatever it's a little creepy the, the, the hug that he gives her but anyway that's a whole other story uh even for later so now we kind of go back to the town itself and the sheriff who is, like I said earlier, this, this bumbling goofball of a sheriff that it, it's really hard to tell if he is the sheriff or if he's a deputy because he kind of acts like a sheriff, but if the rest of them are his deputies, they almost like, it seems like they have no respect for him whatsoever. And it's like, is he the boss or is he a, a toady for these guys? But anyway, he's there uh, playing cards and having lunch with his buddies. And like I said, they kind of treat him really weird. So he goes home, you know, day's over. He's going home. He uh, wakes up in the middle of the night because uh, he hears something. He goes to the kitchen, you know, and, and you get all that suspense music and blah, blah, blah. And, and nothing. There's nothing there. Okay, nothing there. So he grabs some food out of the fridge and he's, he's getting ready to eat something. And then when he turns around, there's like... 20 rats <laughs> on top of his uh, whatever the hell it is he was going to eat. And he's like, ah, he's freaking out. And then all of a sudden the rats jump from the table to him, to his face. And you could see wires. Like you can, you can visually see the wires of people pulling on these wires to make these rats jump or seem to jump to the guy's face. And they start to kind of eat at his face. And it's really, it's kind of gross. It's really kind of gruesome. So he gets the rats off and runs upstairs, tells his wife, we got to get out of here. Blah, blah, blah. Something's going on. Blah, 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 blah. So he gets attacked first. You know, as far as we can see from, from, from the town, that something is happening now in the town itself. 
And he then goes to his office because, you know, he's, something's going on. So it appears that there's something happening and there's uh, military people in the sheriff's office and they're all kind of getting ready to evacuate the town because something is happening and they all notice his face is all messed up and they're like, yeah, he's like, yeah, I got attacked by rats, whatever. And there's some, some wild dogs are around there too. So there's all kinds of weird stuff going on in the town. So back in the... <laughs> Back in the camp, they suffer a second attack in between the all the racially insensitive <laughs> comments from Leslie Nielsen that are going through the film. They're getting attacked a second time, this, this time by a mount, mountain cats. So this time they're a little more shaken up. And Leslie Nielsen was like, I've had it. You know, you don't know where you're going. And they were supposed to find food and they didn't find the food and they're all pissed off. And they, they're kind of breaking into two groups now. Uh, one group is going to continue on track and the other group is just going to like hang out there and wait for rescue to come or something like that or find a different clearing or find a different place or something. So one group, you have the group leader, Mr. Buckner and the Native American guy, the football player, the professor and the TV anchor, the lady, the, the love interest, if you will, of the film. And the other group with Leslie Nielsen, you have the mother son team and the young couple. Now, after the group separates, we focus a little bit on Leslie Nielsen's group. And don't ask me why. Don't ask me how it happened, because you don't see it happening. But we open up with a shot of him walking in pretty darking uh, conditions, a shirtless, for whatever godforsaken reason. He is shirtless, and it starts to rain, and... He is acting like a complete, complete mental patient. Now, in this particular scene, you're, I guess it's supposed to be demonstrating, you know, his mental faculties are completely gone bonkers. I guess we're made to believe that he is being affected by whatever the hell it is that the animals are being affected. For some reason, it chose him. Or maybe not. Maybe that's just his character. He's just a completely bonkers kind of character. That is walking around with a walking stick shirtless with pants on. And it, it, it doesn't seem to kind of like phase anyone. And he's bossing everyone around. And then he gets to a point where he gets into a shoving match with the uh, mother-son team. Takes her, throws her to the ground, pushes the kid, keeps calling him. Come here, you little cockroach. You little. It sounds like he was going to possibly try to call him something else. And then he completely loses his everything. And Andrew Stevens's character, he comes up to kind of challenge him. You know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're losing your mind. You know that kind of thing. You know, you better back off of that. You know, he challenges him, and he takes a. <laughs> I don't remember if it was his walking stick or a stick, and just stabs him in the gut. <laughs> he kills Andrew Stevens's, and it's like, oh my God, he just killed one of the most famous. Uh, possibly only other famous actor in this uh, godforsaken film. And he then turns and focuses on Andrew Stevens' girlfriend, and he's like, come here, baby, I'm going to show you. What <laughs> oh, and you cannot believe this. He's All of a sudden, he's like the rapist in the group, and he's going after the this other younger girl. To understand what's happening here, you have to kind of take a step back and think about William Shatner. William Shatner has made a career, uh, not only out of Star Trek, but he's also made a career about these really bizarre films he's acted in. And the Shat, uh, the legend of the Shat, in terms of him being a complete and utter ham in the way that he acts, and he's got these films under his belt that we are, we are going to do a show about him uh, soon, that are possibly very violent, very bizarre, and it's completely out of character. Well, this is Leslie Nielsen's, I guess, best impression of William Shatner. Because not only is he insane, shirtless, punching, beating people, trying to rape someone, killing a guy. This scene is followed by him um, attacking a bear. Now, you could say it's self-defense. Granted, this is called Day of the Animals. And there is a bear because, uh, you know, part of the whole... Uh, Opening sequence, you can you go through all the different animals that are going wacky all over the place, and the bear is kind of following them around. The night comes, and there's lightning, and all of a sudden, he's like, it's almost like he's got everybody prisoner, and they're huddled. You know, the girl that that he, 
The mother and, and son are huddled in one end and they want to get the hell out of there. And the other girl, she's kind of like in shock. And he all of a sudden, he's like, okay, it's time. Come here, baby. Let's do this. And he's like, oh, God, here we go. He's getting all rapey again. And then in the middle of it, the bear shows up. And he's like, forget this girl. He goes after the bear. Technically, if you watch this movie, and, and you have to watch it because this is so unbelievably bad, technically, he attacks the bear. The bear is just doing the, you know, the, the rah, roaring and, you know, flailing its arms, and then he charges the bear, and those two go at it, and again, you have to remember, this is from the makers of Grizzly, so you knew they were going to stick a bear in here somewhere, but it is just so outrageously ridiculous. Ridiculous that a shirtless middle-aged man is going to charge a bear. Uh, and I guess uh, the bear just kind of rips him to shreds at some point because that kind of enables the group to kind of get away from him and start heading in a different direction, you know, while this guy is trying to... Uh, I mean, y you will not have seen a man versus bear scene as... Exciting is this one, uh, unless you've seen The Revenant. The Revenant has a very good uh, DiCaprio bear scene, but this one is just unbelievable because the only other person that could possibly play this character would have been William Shatner. It is just incredible what a overacting, hammy, trying to play it straight but comes off as complete slapsticky comedy. I mean, these scenes could have been right out of The Naked Gun or Airplane because. It's, it's just incredible. It's funny because like the bear show, right before the bear shows up, he starts like cursing God and the lightning and the sky and he's like challenging God. <laughs> it's just so weird. I couldn't imagine him reading the script and going, yeah, I could do this. I, I see something good in this. Is, I could do, this is a challenge for me. It, it, it's just unbelievable how this, this, this character... <laughs> But it's great. It is just great watching it. So this particular group, like I said, they start wandering off on their own without the, <laughs> the man bear dancing scene of Leslie Nielsen. And uh, we then cut to the other group, which is the older man with the very young girl that are finally out of the woods and they're now near town. So they, they're walking through town. But as they walk around, they notice that, yeah, everybody's been evacuated already. They try to jump in a car, and it's full of snakes. It's like, what? Yeah, okay, the car's full of snakes. Oh, we haven't we haven't messed with that yet. So, yes, they, there's a car full of snakes, so they get away from that car. And then the guy tries to go in the house, and he can't get in. And then he starts to kind of lose it. And I don't know if he's supposed to be losing it because he's just hysterical, or if it's because he's kind of being affected by the same thing that Leslie Nielsen's character is being affected to, even though we were told earlier in the movie that, you know, the closer up in altitude that you are, you know, I guess the ozone layer is affecting the, those animals more than, you know, people that are in the lower elevations. But it doesn't matter in this particular case. All the animals are just out of their freaking minds. And he kind of starts losing it. He starts screaming at the little girl, and then he realizes he's uh, he's going over the top and he's calling her a bad girl and he then gives her a hug and it, it, it does get a little, a little, it gets kind of creepy of him kind of hugging this very young girl and I don't know. So they keep wandering through the town seeing if they could find something and they find, uh, I think it's either a military truck or some kind of truck and out of the truck pops the dead sheriff. The sheriff we met earlier, the guy that the rats were eating his face, I guess. Even the animals finally got to him. So they, they keep uh, running around trying to find another car and they're all of a sudden there's a bunch of dogs now coming after them and he's like, all right, here's what we got to do. They're in a car, they can't get it started. So he's like, okay, you stay in this car and I'm going to go see over there. There's my other car, my, the car that I came in here with. I'm going to start that car and bring it over. And then we're going to get away in that car. So he kind of hugs her goodbye, gives her this really, again, creepy, creepy, weird kiss, which is like, Ugh. you just want to kind of like take a shower halfway through this movie. And he goes out to try to start that car. And the dogs are kind of following him there's a dog that's you know very uh, cujo looking dog and then he kind of backs into slowly backs into this little bw uh, beetle that he has and as he's sitting in the seat hey guess what it's full of snakes just like before so he gets completely bitten by snakes and the dog jumps on him and they just basically have a feast and the little girl is you know 
locked in the other car, just looking at this happening. You know, you can kind of see the therapy bills that this poor girl is going to be going through in the rest of her life. Uh, not only the character, but possibly the actress too, I imagine, because, oh my God, this is just God awful. Now we jump to the, uh, the, the mother... Uh, son and the other girl group you know they're out of the woods and they find the clearing and they find a what appears to be a crashed helicopter or at least a helicopter that whose pilot is dead on the floor and it seems to be slightly somewhat wrecked and all of a sudden all these dogs uh, come running out of the woods or uh, panthers or whatever the heck they are and they all jump inside the helicopter and kind of lock themselves in as the animals are going crazy on top of the helicopter, under it and all that stuff. But they can't obviously go anywhere. The helicopter is grounded and they don't have a pilot. The pilot is being eaten a few uh, yards away from them. We now cut to the other group that we completely forgot about now. And uh, they're approaching these bungalows, the famous bungalows that they were trying to reach at some point. And they go from, uh, you know, from room to room. And all of a sudden, they see far away a whole bunch of dogs. Here we go again. A whole bunch of German shepherds. Now, what the hell are German shepherds doing in a mountain? Who the hell knows? But obviously, that's all we could afford. So that's what they have, German shepherds. And they're coming after them. And they kind of barricade themselves in, in one bungalow. And, and they wait it out. And then all of a sudden, they go away. And they're like, okay, everything's clear now. Let's get out of here. And just as they're stepping out, a second wave of dogs or the same wave that they're hiding around, uh, you know, they were playing possum for them. They charge again and this time they get in there and they start eating them all up. So in this uh, insanity, uh, let's see, the football player is being eaten, the professor is being eaten by dogs. So the guide and the Indian uh, manage to slip out and the, uh, the TV anchor, you know, the, the female lead, she also manages to slip out. And they're all running towards the creek and they kind of dislodge this tiny little pier and uh, because the lady can't swim. So these guys are going to make a run for it. But So they all kind of hang on to this pier and they start going down the river. But a couple of dogs jump on top of the pier. So now you have a floating pier going down the river, down the rapids kind of, and them hanging on to the rapids. And the dog's trying to bite them and they're trying to punch the dogs. And they're able to... I guess, get rid of, somehow get rid of the dogs, and they just keep going down that river, down that river. All of a sudden, we cut back to the helicopter, that's uh, the, you know, the people hiding in the helicopter, and they start to hear all this screaming, all this screeching, animal screeches, and they look around, and all of a sudden, all the animals are dead. Everything is dead on the ground. They even open the, the door of the helicopter, and a dead dog falls from on top of the helicopter down on the ground, and they, oh, they're all startled by it. And, uh, you know, just out of the blue, everything is, uh, seems to be going back to normal, except all the animals are dead. And out in the distance, they do see another helicopter is coming, kind of like to rescue them. And we cut back to the town and you have this um, group of, I imagine, our soldiers in hazmat suits carrying rifles and they're talking about and you hear kind of like a radio station or the com or the communication over the radio talking about how oh yeah things seem to be correcting themselves and the animals are dying and everybody's okay now you know uh, except for all the dead people in the town the town is littered with dead animals and it's littered with dead people and the soldiers are commenting that oh yeah these are dead people because they were looters and they came back and they're trying to loot and the animals ate them it's like okay oh, Okay, that's uh, wonderful. Uh, the hazmat suits look completely ridiculous. They basically look like aluminum foil, some kind of a firefighter outfit wrapped in an aluminum foil. <laughs> so, hey, whatever. And they find a little girl, you know, in the car. So they kind of rescue her in a way, I guess you could say. So, you know, they don't kill off the little girl. She's fine. And we then go back uh, and we see the raft that is kind of floating through the river. And finally, the raft is reaching civilization, I guess, and some of this town area. So the, you know, we get our heroes, our, our lead characters, if you can call them lead characters. We kind of know that they've survived and, you know, it's it's over. The, the ordeal is over. Everything's back to normal. But the movie ends with a shot of one of these hawks or falcons or whatever kind of up there as, uh, on the sunset and you could see him perched on a tree kind of looking like, uh, you know, you watch it or I'll come back type of thing. This movie is, it's really hard to explain. It is so incredibly bad that it's good. It actually does the entire turn of, okay, well, this could be just a, 
eh, not so good, you know, uh, 70s disaster film. Okay, they have, there's many good disaster films. And then the movie kind of continues to turn that circle to the point where it's like, this is completely un- unredeemable. It is horribly acted, horribly written. Very good actors are acting in such a bizarre manner. And Leslie Nielsen steals the movie by what a kook he is in this thing. So you've gotten to the point where the movie is horrendous. And it's a horrendous movie. But you just keep making that circle where it's like, wait a minute. This is so incredibly bad that I'm actually enjoying how bad it is. As I'm watching this movie, I'm doing my own version of Mystery Science Theater. I'm doing my own commentary on every little stupid line that actors are delivering or actors are doing. And I'm hating it and enjoying it at the same time. It is a bizarre uh, situation. Now, I believe this movie was covered, if anybody's familiar with Rift Tracks, where they do a kind of like a mystery science theater type of thing. And, and you can find them online, and I believe it's a paid uh, download if you want to hear their take on it. But I, I just suggest, look it up. This is the type of movie that is showing up in some, either a Netflix or a Hulu or an, an Amazon, or hell, it's on YouTube. You can watch a horrendous version of it. They have a couple of versions, but you can watch them on YouTube. I'm telling you, it is just so unbelievable. The scene of Leslie Nielsen beating people up and trying to attack the girl and then wrestling a bear, there's tons of it in YouTube, and you just are not going to believe it. This movie was so awful that I ended up watching it a second time because, again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the quality was so bad from this cable channel that I said, all right, you know what? This is ha- there's got to be a better version of this movie and maybe it's even letterbox so i was able to find a letterbox version i forget through which channel or what service it might have been amazon prime it might have been amazon prime i'm pretty sure it was and to make matters worse i even ordered a dvd version of it because i wanted to see if i could get my hands on some of the extras or supplementals or commentaries Unfortunately, the one I found, which was like a $2 version on eBay, did not have uh, any of those extras. But from what I've been reading, uh, the extras don't really go into why the movie's so bad because everybody was taking it so serious. And the best would have been uh, Leslie Nielsen to, to really get his point of view on what the hell is this all about, you know. I'm watching these scenes and I'm th- my mind is screaming Shatner. This is Shatner. Shatner at some point watched this movie and said, this is what I'm going to do with my life, <laughs> with my career. You couldn't even call it a guilty pleasure. This is, it's more of a train wreck pleasure. It's a movie that is so bad that it's good. So I would suggest get together with your friends. Uh, maybe uh, get a few beers, get some pizza, get some popcorn, and just go to town because this movie, it's about an hour and a half of complete insanity. You will not regret it. However, you will never get that hour and a half back you know, to your life. You can collect them all. You are a toy! Batteries not included. Does he get those wonderful toys? Details on specially marked packages at participating stores. Is that the $6 million man's boss? It's Oscar Goldman. Why do you have that? That's worth a lot of money. That's much more valuable than Steve Austin. Action figures each sold separately. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Some assembly required. All your favorite Star Wars heroes and villains. I have three of each. One to display, one to open, and one just in case. For today's collectible segment, I'm going to talk about a certain line of, can't really call them action figures, they're more like vinyl statues, if you will. They do have some articulation, but they're really meant to be displayed and really not too much, you know, posing and playing with them. What I'm talking about here is a line they came up with from, I believe, 2002 from a company called X Plus USA. What we're dealing with here is a line of Ray Harryhausen classic stop motion animation characters from his films, from his entire body of work. Now, this is a collection that I wish they would have continued because there were so many more figures they could have made. These figures stand about, let's say, about six inches high as far as the height goes. Some of them, including one of them, that which is the dragon, it is a very long, it's over a foot long. So 
for the price, you do get a great, great bargain. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of gravitated toward these sets. They do sell many, many vinyl kits. And this day and age, you can find a lot of them very well made, sculpted, obviously, you know, cast and sold, you know, in their vinyl forms, unpainted, unassembled. But you really have to be somewhat talented at, you know, painting and assembling these things, which I, I am just afraid to really get my hands into them. I'm afraid I might mess them up, even though I've had a little experience with vinyl models. It's just that the ability to, you know, weather a character or a creature and make it look really good, it's something that I really don't want to mess up. But let me give you a little bit of a list of what we're dealing with here. Like I said, the main reason I selected them and I started collecting them in the first place because I knew there were others out there. There were smaller ones, there were bigger ones, but for the price range that I was looking for, this is what was available and kind of still is. Let's go in uh, order of when these films came out. First one is the Ymir, I believe. Could be wrong in how I'm pronouncing it. And this is a creature from the movie 20 Million Miles to Earth. This is one of his uh, earlier films, black and white, about a creature basically that arrives from outer space and it starts to grow and grow and grow and the stop motion version of the creature at one point is kind of small probably as small as as what we're seeing here with the actual figure that's being sold but it kind of looks like it's very lizardish it has a dinosaurish kind of tail probably a tyrannosaurus rex kind of feet let's say but the body seems to be a kind of like a humanish lizardy body with a very very lizardish almost gargoyle like head the figure like i mentioned earlier like most of these stands about eh, about six inches tall the mouth is posable. You can actually open and close the mouth. You can kind of move the head left and right. The, the hands and maybe a little bit of the feet can be positioned a little bit, you know, to give it a little bit of uh, posability. You do have to be careful with a lot of these that you don't bend certain parts because you'll snap them. Now, what's cool about them is that if you accidentally snap some of these joints, because they were built in sections, it's very, very easy to glue them back together because they usually have, they usually fit inside each other. In other words, they were separate pieces that were glued together to make them fit. But there is some articulation in most of these. I would say with your basic, let's say five points of articulation, some of them maybe a little less, some of them a little more. Some of them that have tails, if they have some kind of tail, you might be able to adjust the tail. This particular one, like I said, it's a stand-up kind of figure. The coloring is great. You know, it's a black and white movie. They did produce, I remember, some color renditions of, you know, in the posters of what this thing's supposed to look like. But, hey, listen, this is great. Especially if you're a stop-motion fan, this is a way of being able to, you know, look at these recreations, if you will, of classic stop-motion creatures. Up next, you have the Talus. Now, the Talus is from Jason and the Argonauts. There's so many more creatures in Jason and the Argonauts that I wish they would have made. Jason and the Argonauts is my favorite of all the older classic stop-motion Ray Harryhausen films. I absolutely love Clash of the Titans because that is the first one I believe I probably saw in the theater. I could be wrong, but I think it was probably the first one I actually saw in the theater. Most of the other ones I had seen before on TV. I, there's a slight chance I might have seen Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger in the theater. But anyway, the Talos is the one that in the movie, I believe he's kind of like a statue. He's kind of there like a statue. And all of a sudden, the state, it's supposed to be gigantic, a gigantic, enormous statue. And the statue kind of comes to life and comes after, you know, our heroes, I believe. Um, well, this one is, again, it's about six inches tall. He does have some posable articulation. Uh, he is holding a sword. And because it's supposed to be a statue, a gigantic statue, I say again, it is painted in the manner of kind of like a green and dark bronzy kind of color you know a statue that's been kind of changing color and weathered and aged over you know hundreds or thousands of years or something like that it is very good you know it at least gives us one representation of a character from jason and the argonauts i wish they would have done the skeletons but obviously it's very difficult in vinyl to probably mess around and create skeletons because they're so thin that they would probably be very difficult to cast, I imagine, and even super difficult to pose and to keep them standing up. But 
I digress. There are so many other creatures. In Jason, the multi-headed dragon monster at the end, you know, they could have done that. But anyway, I get ahead of myself. Then you have, from 1958, the seventh voyage of Sinbad, the Cyclops and the dragon. Now, let's start with the Cyclops. The Cyclops, you could kind of say it's a little bit uh, reminiscent in terms of how this creature is posed as the Ymir, in terms of it being a two-legged, two-arm, monstery type of thing. Now, granted, this particular creature is not a dinosaurish kind of reptile thing this is the 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 cyclops it's it's a mythological creature it has kind of like goat-ish legs very muscular but with like hoofs at the end uh, it doesn't have feet or claws it's hoofs and it's a very dark color you know from the waist down but then from the waist up it's a very muscular looking let's say somewhat human very augmented crossing almost over into a dinosaurish type of skin instead of fingers it's got three claws and it is the cyclops it also has the horn right in the middle you know over its one eye i do remember i believe this one is from the beach scene where the cyclops i think he's guarding something and the you know the our heroes uh, are attacked by it this particular figure is a little bit more difficult to pose because of the fact that it uses hoofs instead of feet, so it doesn't have that much support. It still has some articulation, so you could kind of do a little bit of movement with him. But again, another great representation of your stop-motion classic characters. Now, the other character from that same movie is the dragon. Now, this is an excellent, excellent, excellent figure. It is the biggest one of all of them. It is huge. It is very long. It is probably, I would say, over a foot, maybe a foot and a half long, because the tail is almost half the body. It does have lots of articulation, all four legs, the neck, and the tail also has a little bit of articulation. And as I mentioned earlier, I unfortunately snapped the tail in one of the our latest moves that we had, and I was able to just glue it back on without any problems. A great color scheme, you know, the green, the very rich green with the very red mouth. It just pops so well. And, you know, if you don't touch the, the, the figures, if you don't kind of feel them out... They look like statues. They look like miniature statues, but they're made out of vinyl. And that's what kind of keeps the price down for a lot of these things, at least initially when they were first available, you know, for purchase. Up next, you have 1973's The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, another one of the Sinbad films. We have three different characters. So let's start with the Griffin. The Griffin is, again, another classic mythological character. It kind of has the body of, let's say, either a lion or a wolf, but the head is of a, uh, like a hawk, let's say, and it has wings. It's kind of like part of the body is covered in fur and part of the body is covered in feathers, let's say. This is a pretty big, beefy character. The proportions are, obviously, all these characters are not in proportion to each other because they're many different sizes but in order to keep it within that six inch line you know the tip of the wings they go up to about the six inch level so they're pretty they're pretty high you know and it's it's posed in a way where it's got its you know wings spread and that sort of thing now this one doesn't have that much articulation you might be able to move this piece or that piece a little bit but like i mentioned before just like with the dragon it is such a beautiful looking you know, like a museum type looking piece. And until you pick it up and touch it, you don't realize that it's just plain old light vinyl. But they did an excellent, excellent job with it. The next one from the same movie, we have the Centaur. Now, the Centaur is a really weird looking character. Again, you're dealing with almost like two combinations of characters. The bottom of the body is almost like a, it's almost like a horse, let's say. It's got hooves, it's got a tail, a very long tail, kind of like a longish tail. But then the top of the body, where a horse would then lead to the head, let's say, this one leads to a a man's kind of, uh, you know, midriff uh, chest area. Colored completely different. It's practically black, like deep black. And the head is of a creature that has also a cyclops kind of format to the face. It is also holding a club, but the centaur, like I said, it does have some articulation, especially in the arms and, and a couple of spots here or there. Another tall one, because again, because they're sticking to that six inch height, it gives them additional room, you know, to make so much more. And the third one from that movie is the Kali. The Kali is that classic 
I believe, Indian god. In the movie, it's a statue. It's a stone statue and of this Indian goddess, let's say. And it's in a in a stance. It's standing in a certain stance with the legs kind of apart. And it has six arms. In the movie, I believe, all the arms end up grabbing swords and they end up fighting with it. Here, they don't add the swords, but they do have the arms all spread out so you kind of are able to see all of those six arms. This one is another one of those kind of difficult ones to stand because of the feet. They're kind of small. You can kind of move the feet a little bit. There is a little tiny bit of articulation, but it's the type of thing where I believe I ended up <laughs> articulating them on by accident because I snap, once again, I snap the glue. And because there is a slight bit of a joint there, it was possible for me to continue to make adjustments to the feet without necessarily having to glue them in place. This way, giving it a little more balance uh, because it's very top heavy. It's one of these top heavy creatures that make it a little difficult to pose. The color is kind of like a dark gray. It's not the kind of green bronze combo that the talus had but it's it is another you know statue based creature then finally as part of this line from the movie simbad and the eye of the tiger from 1977 we have the minotaur which is basically a if you remember that movie it's a basically a minotaur let's say but it is a kind of like a robotic golden minotaur so it's not a creature minotaur it's really a, a robot if you think about it a mechanical evil creature and this is the one that is kind of like the thug for the bad wizard you know he's there guarding the bad wizard all the time and again the, the star wars connection that i always look for things the minotaur was played by peter mayhew who played chewbacca in the original star wars films Again, this is one of his previous roles. The figure itself is gorgeous because of the gold coloring. You know, it looks very, very good. It has some posability in the head and the arms, you know, the usual five points of articulation. It has a little more support because it is holding a lance. And the lance, you can, because he's, you know, grab, grabbing onto this lance, you can kind of position the arm and the lance to kind of help him balance himself when you kind of place him down. So it does really help. As I mentioned earlier, this is um, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. There were so many more characters they could have made. Uh, like I said before, the, the Sabertooth Tiger, that was such a cool character. There's so many things they could have done. But for whatever reason, this particular line kind of ended there. They didn't go any further with this size. The original prices, I believe, you could have originally, if you bought them when they first came out, you could have gotten them anywhere from four to five dollars a piece to maybe i don't know 10 bucks a piece nowadays a little harder to find you're never going to find them in a store i'm pretty sure they are available on ebay pretty much most of them are still available you're going to pay anything from let's say 15 to 70 dollars uh, some people are completely completely delusional and trying to sell these things for 70 dollars or even more but you still can find them you know every now and then you can see them they're you know 15 20 bucks a piece so that's not a bad price for what you get here's the thing to keep in mind is that when you actually do get them the worst thing about these figures is the packaging there is practically no packaging when i purchased them they basically came i believe in a little plastic bag and the figure was in the bag the figure also had a uh, kind of like a rubber bandy type of attachment to the arm let's say with a little piece of paper you know, little 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 cardboard with the name of the movie and a little tiny miniature poster. I think I kind of threw all those away or lost them or something. I guess that's how they would be able to save money on them is to not do any fancy packaging in any shape or form. Now, this company, as well as other companies, like I said earlier, offer other versions of all of these figures and more. They do have like skeletons, let's say, from Jason. There, some of them might be made out of pewter, some of them are made out of other materials, uh, not necessarily vinyl, obviously, and you are going to pay a lot more money for those. A lot of his other films, you could find a lot of the creatures that you wish they would have made in this format in other price points. Unfortunately, they are usually higher price points. And like I mentioned earlier, this is one of the things that attracted me to this particular line, was the fact that they were so cheap at the time. I didn't get them when they originally put out. I ended up buying them through eBay also many, many years ago. And yeah, I was paying maybe 10 bucks a piece, 15 bucks a piece, something like that. 
And it's one of those mixed blessings in terms of you do find something you like, but then on the other hand, there's not a lot that they make. So it kind of helps me, you know, not to go crazy going, you know, looking for all these other ones. They didn't make any Clash of the Titans, you know, which is a fantastic movie. They have so many cool creatures they could have made from Clash of the Titans. And if they were made at this price point, man, they would have been amazing. They could have done just about all the classic uh, Harryhausen creatures. But hey, what are you going to do? This is the best you can get your hands on. I do recommend, if you like these figures, if you have the means, <laughs> if you have the means, uh, go on eBay, go on um, Amazon, uh, just go on to do an internet search for these. These are, like I said, they're called X Plus USA is the company that put them out. But if you just go on eBay and you type Ray Harryhausen figures, statues, anything like that, you're going to get, like I said, all these different companies and all their different products. There are also, you know, that could kind of go along with this line, many kits. I mentioned it earlier. There's a Clash of the Titan kit for Medusa. My God, that thing is gorgeous. But obviously they're showing you the finished product. You are responsible for putting the kit together and then painting it. So, that's the only thing that's kind of keeping me away from dipping into the the realm of these imported kits. They're also imported. You got to keep in mind, these things are coming from China or Thailand or Hong Kong. So you always run the risk of, you know, maybe getting ripped off or those things taking four months to arrive or the product you get not looking exactly like what you thought it was going to be or the workmanship. You never know how good of a quality product you have. And then when you're dealing with international, it's a little more difficult to return things and get your money back and that sort of thing. But if the price is right, you might want to take a chance and, you know, risk it. You know, I wouldn't recommend doing something like that for a, you know, $100 or $200 kit, you know. But if these kits are, I don't know, 10 20 bucks, it might be worth taking a shot if you're really into the vinyl models and that sort of thing. As I mentioned on a, a previous episode, you know, the, that I have a model kit. I built one. It wasn't imported. It wasn't uh, through eBay. It was actually bought at a store here in the U.S. many years ago from Bram Stoker's Dracula line. And it is vinyl. And the thing about vinyl, you have to be careful with it. You have to prime it really well. And then you have to use the right paint, the paint that works with vinyl as opposed to paints that work with regular plastics. There are certain acrylics, I believe, and there's vinyl paints and all types of things that you need to know about. You should do a little research. You need to type how to paint a vinyl model because if you use the wrong paint, you end up with very tacky, sticky surfaces that never seem to dry here it could be a year later and it will never dry because it does not adhere to the vinyl very well so once again i strongly recommend this uh, if you're into this sort of thing it's another way of being able to relive your ray harryhausen childhood memories and having some kind of a representation of these magnificent figures that what's amazing about them also is the fact that because you're dealing with stop motion characters they look very much very very much like what you would have in your hands it's not like an action figure that's a representation of a human character let's say for example or or anything like that you can kind of picture you know somebody like ray harryhausen animating these characters in that format in that scale so that's kind of neat and it's a way to uh, keep you know up with your collecting all right well i hope you guys enjoyed today's show I'd like to thank you guys as usual for continuing to listen and we will return next week with some more updated genre material. We have lots of different topics to cover in the future. We've started so many new ongoing pieces that uh, we would like to continue not only in the collectible side but you know with many different subjects. We're going to have some television updates pretty soon, more movies. We are getting near the end of our summer movie season but they're still coming fast and furious and we're getting some dvds here or there that i you know didn't have a chance to review while these films were out i'm going to start to hit some of those too so until next week thank you for listening and we will see you here soon at geek fest rants bye bye everybody What begins as a pleasant day of hiking in the woods becomes the day of the animals. You know, we would have been better off staying with...
with Buckner. Well, you're not with Hotshot Buckner now. You're with me, Miss Beverly Hills, bitch. Uh. So shut up and keep moving. Get going! You can't touch me. You little cockroach! You gonna tell me about survival? Leave my boy alone! Well, you just you shut leave up. my boy alone! Shut up, you little cockroach! Or I'll shove you off the cliff! No. You lily livered punk! I'm running this camping trip! I take what I want and I give you what I want to give you! Understand that? Stop it, please! Please! And right now I want that! Come on, baby. You're gonna have a real man now. No, you're crazy! No! Hands on! I'll kill you! If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2017. <laughs>Broadcast is part of the IC Robots Radio Network. Visit icrobots.com for this and many other nerd slash nostalgia related podcasts. You won't be sorry for long. <laughs>